Swiftly we're turning. Swiftly we're turning. standing. Caleb, will you just review some prayer, please? Eternal God in heaven, we stand in awe of your power and greatness. We're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, that you spared our lives down to this moment of time. That we come in out of the world, come into those of like precious faith, and how an hour of refreshing as we open up your holy writs as promised. We're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for the many good teachers that are here. We pray that you, uh, we're thankful that they have the ability and desire to teach the class, give them wisdom and knowledge this evening, dear Heavenly Father, as they impart your word upon those that are listening. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, we learn from those things as we take those things in our hearts this evening. Continue to be with this good church. We will be that shining light you have to be. Continue to be with the elders and they oversee the flock, continue to bless them with wisdom, dear Heavenly Father. Continue to be with the deacons and watch over them as they continue, continue to serve and be with Gary as he stands and continues to proclaim your own word. Again, give him good health and have many years in your service. Thanks for being here. Dear Heavenly Father, we know there will be those that will be sick this evening. We pray your healing hands be upon them as we hear from them. Forgive us for our sins, repent, and turn from them. Keep us through this hour. It's King Jesus' name that we pray. 399, 399. <clears throat> There's a land that is fairer than me, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Savior is over me, to prepare us a flowing place.
99 was the invitation. One ninety-nine. Yeah. Well, if they want, that's for tonight. Um, Sunday morning, I announced that I would give you a sheet for the Sunday morning lesson. If you want one, Kevin or uh, I will give it. This is question 13 in the book that you have for Sunday mornings. So uh, rather than wait till Sunday, if some of it want it early. And then if you need one of these, raise your hand. We'll see what you get for tonight. The white sheet. The white sheet is for Sunday morning. The pink sheet is for tonight. I'm slowly learning not to touch things or say very much because it's usually wrong. Uh, and whatever I touch up here, uh, Sean had put, put all the songs on, and I came up and immediately erased them. So then uh, uh, Daniel, thankfully, has uh, put them back on or some way or got another got them back on for the songs this evening. But uh, we're studying the subject of humility. We're down to number 15 on that pink sheet that you have, John the Baptist. And uh, we referred to Matthew chapter 3, 11, 14, and 16 through 17. All of those passages are with, uh, have to do with John the Baptist. But the first uh, thing that I want to mention about John the Baptist is in John 1, verses 22 through 27. And that's not even listed on here. In fact, we'll look at several passages this evening uh, that aren't listed on your sheet. Uh, but in continuing the study, I, I added them. In... Uh, Locust and wild honey, as you see the picture there, is what we remember about John as far as his environment was concerned. But in John 1, 22 through 27, then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, Now the, those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Now, that language gives us the first indication concerning the humility of John the Baptist. Uh, he could well have said if somebody would benefit him, his position of authority, he could have well said, well, yeah, there's another one after me, but I'm the, the focal point right now. I'm the one that needs to uh, impress you with the things that I say. So focus on me. Look at me. But he didn't approach it that way. He said, this is the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, what has been uh, prophesied as far as other prophets are concerned. And so John 1, 22 through 27 you see down there in the uh, yellow large letters at the corner um, is a really important lesson that I uh, thought we ought, ought to begin with this evening. Having said that then, I want to spend our time in, in uh, how God saw true servanthood in John the Baptist. 
And up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll notice 2 Chronicles 16 at verse 9. Uh, and I use this in a general sense, in that God is always looking for servants. He had providentially cared for John the Baptist and for him coming six months birthwise, even before Christ, to prepare the way. And other examples throughout the Old and New Testament, God is always looking for someone to serve him. And that's what this passage says. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And I, I looked at this passage and I think, I, I know it's Old Testament, but doesn't the sentiment of it, doesn't the principle of it really fit those of us who are Christians? That he looks at us, he evaluates us, he knows us, the very hairs of our head are numbered, he says. And so in, with that kind of intimacy, we also need to acknowledge in this passage that he is always looking at which one of us might be his servant. And so he expects, the book of Hebrews talks about how he expects better, th better things of us. And so again, not to set ourselves up on a pedestal, but rather to humble our hearts that God uh, would be served and we might be the proper servant. So God needs voices, and John the Baptist is going to be one, for, one voice for God. Uh, now I mentioned there in that, first white line up there, God saw the servanthood. Not only was he looking in the Second Chronicles 16, 9, but now coming to Mark 1, 2 through 3, he quotes from both Malachi 3, 1 and Isaiah 40 at verse 3 in those opening verses. And the words messenger and voice refer to John the Baptist, uh, the prophet God sent to prepare the way for his son. And again, back to what we had listed earlier with Matthew 3 and Luke 3 and John 1. Uh, 19 through 34. In other words, with all of these passages of Scripture, uh, they complement each other. They, they work together uh, to fulfill prophecy, to fulfill the meaning of what it is to serve the Lord. Now, I also noted here that in ancient times, so I'm told, before a king visited any part of the kingdom or the realm in which he was uh, supervising or had the authority, a messenger was sent before him to prepare, to prepare the way. You and I, with the telecommunications that we have today uh, and with all that is at our uh, disposal, uh, we don't think too much about messengers going out. We'll just give them a call or we'll text them or you know, send some form of Twitter or whatever it might be. But back in the days of in the ancient times, it was said uh, they didn't have such devices that we have. And so this messenger was sent to prepare. The king is coming. The king is coming. And so go out and shout with a loud voice, and prepare the way. And this included both uh, things with, with regard to maybe some of the work that needed to be done in the kingdom, maybe the repairing of roads, uh, preparing the people that uh, whatever roads they had back then that were going to be into construction. Uh, I read some things that in ancient times they had preparation made uh, for people to be warned. The, the war, roads are going to have work crews on them. Uh, and again, they're not going to be out there with all of the machinery that we have today. But if you are transporting livestock or uh, driving a herd of a uh, flock of goats or sheep or a herd of cattle, uh, if you're carrying some type of vegetable, if you're uh, transporting wine in vases or um, uh, vases vessels, uh, and and uh, you need to know where we would say the potholes are. I'm just telling you this that as far as history is concerned. This wasn't out of the way for John the Baptist to be referred to as the one preparing the way for Christ. In other words, uh, beforehand, as I said before I really read this, I, I always kind of thought of John the Baptist as just being the, uh, the herald that goes out in front and says, here he comes, here he comes. But there's much more to it than that. And as I said, this is based on their uh, practice at the time. And by calling the nation to repentance in John's case, you know, it says that John baptized unto repentance, uh, that he prepared the way for the Lord. And, and Isaiah and Malachi, in their prophecies, again, in uh, I mentioned in Malachi 3, 1, and Isaiah 40 and verse 3, uh, they join the voices that uh, John the Baptist is using here in declaring that Jesus Christ is the Lord Jehovah God. Now, the second thing that I want to mention here uh, is that John... Uh, 
was humble because he closed his mouth to complaining. And here's something else. Again, we're, we have a lot of things that we can say about John, but we're trying to stay focused on this, the aspect of his humility. And by this, I'm looking at John 3, 22 through 27. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Anytime you have a dispute, you're going to have people taking sides. It's not a new problem. And sometimes you have to settle the matter. <laughs> we learned this morning that yesterday at our, our grandson Colton uh, stepped between two boys that were fighting. They were, they were on the football team. They hadn't played, or hadn't dressed as far as was concerned. But Colton just stepped, they were fighting, fist fighting. And Colton just stepped in between them and he said, boys, it's all about peace. <laughs> and I guess all his friends around just kind of laughed at the way he handled it. But that's exactly what John the Baptist was doing. His humility was such that he was saying, you've got these divisions about who's baptizing. Uh, John the Baptist, uh, Jesus, what, you know, what's this all about? And so there are, are factions. And anytime you have a faction, you need somebody to kind of prepare the way, to smooth the road. And this is what takes place. John answered at verse 27 and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. And so by the ordinance of God, John was there to bring peace, as it were, uh, to the people. And without realizing it, the disciples that were following after John were putting him into a, a situation of competing against the Lord Jesus. We're not in competition. We're cousins. And even though our, there are family feuds, that's not Jesus, that's not me. We're not into bickering among the family. But even more than that, he's the Messiah. I'm simply preparing the way. That's how humble John was. So I understand in John 3 at verse 26, he says, all men come to him. Uh, sounds like a, a, a wail of despair. All men come to him. Exclamation point. Again, John 3 and verse 26. And it's interesting to note that, that four of the greatest men in the Bible face this problem of comparison and competition. And I'll not go back and read all of this, but if you're interested, Moses had to deal with this in Numbers 11, 26 through 30. And then here it was John the Baptist in, in John 3, 26 through 30. Jesus, as a part of this uh, problem in Luke 9, 46 through 50, not as a part of the problem, but probably the ongoing situation. And then the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, verses 15 through 18. Now, how did John the Baptist handle this controversy? Basically, he stepped in between and says, boys, it's, about, it's not about us in competition, not about us fighting. It's about peace. It's about getting along. And so John could have had this arrogant attitude about it. and said, yeah, he's got his disciples and I've got mine and we'll see which one comes out the better. No, that, that wasn't John's attitude. This is why we can learn a great deal from his humility. Uh, he wasn't proud. So he, he didn't uh, grasp on to Jesus' ministry uh, on his coattails or try to do something that he wasn't intended to do. He knew that he was just a voice and whatever God wanted to do with that voice was great with him. But as we see, this controversy revealed a, a deeper level of humility in John's life. Now that's the first two points. Let me stop there because I'm just basically preaching or lecturing here because I've got all this information. But I don't want to shut you out, uh, give you an opportunity to say anything that you'd like to comment on about uh, either points one or two. God saw servanthood. And John closed his mouth to complain. Anything about that that you want to mention? David? I think the first, that Isaiah 40 is, a, I love Isaiah 40, but that, that first three verses also, or the first two verses also make reference to John the Baptist. Yes. 
And the peace you're talking about is it says, comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord, and that's what he did. Speak tenderly, Jerusalem, and cry to them that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Their sin will be pardoned, because this is all talking about Isaiah 40. Is, is a, uh, <coughs> what's it called? It's, it's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. It's, it's got John the Baptist around there. So when you see the rolled up to the end of Isaiah 40, you, you lift it up on eagles' wings and such. But that first, that's what he says John was going to do. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, cry to her, say, your iniquity is, is, has been paid in full. Yeah. And we'll take care of it. So just want to point that out. Yeah, thank you for pointing out because I, just for the sake of time, I didn't want to read it all and say everything, so I really appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, but yeah, the Isaiah 40 just uh, really sheds a lot of light on this. Good thought. Anyone else have a, an idea or a thought you want to share with us? Well, the, the third point I have up here is that John the Baptist was humbled because he opened his will to God. So remember what we just read uh, concerning him being open to the Lord's will. Um, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So we appreciate the direction of God through his written word. It humbles us. We don't become arrogant and say, well, we're going to make the rules and laws and regulations. We're going to, to tell people what to do because we're going to set up a committee or we're going to have an elder board or a deacon board or whatever other council board that you might want to, which a lot of denominations have, by the way. And they make their own rules and regulations. But we understand that John is saying, you know, unless God says this, we better leave it alone. We better leave it as in God's business. We don't, as the old time preachers used to say, we don't want to whittle on God's end of the stick. So John saw that his duty in life was to obey God. And, and whatever the cost or even the discomfort, uh, it didn't matter to him because he was here again as a servant uh, for the Lord. All he wanted was to be a voice for God, a Somebody called him one time a tool in God's hand and thus uh, allowed what God would give him from heaven to be his, his sacred duty. Uh, and that simple childlike faith, uh, his humble service are what Christ's words about John uh, being great are reflecting. By that I mean that in John the Baptist had a deeply held conviction of the ministry the teaching that he was engaged in and the blessings from God. Uh, back to John 3 at verse 27 again. Unless it has been given to him from heaven. Paul would have agreed with this in 1 Corinthians 3 uh, verses 1 through 9 and again in chapter 4 verses 1 through 7 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, since all our, our gifts and opportunities come from the Lord, then whatever he does with those gifts through us uh, is totally his will. The end result must always be that God alone receives the glory. And that's, that's something that we need to concentrate and focus a, a great deal on, is for God to receive the glory. That's, that's the kind of humility we need to develop, that we need to have. Uh, that whatever we do, uh, Colossians 3, verse 18, or 16, whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. It's, it's not for us to receive the glory, but it's for God to receive the glory. Uh, one passage just now popped in my head. Let me see if it's right. Ephesians 3, uh, verse 21. Ephesians 3, 21. Let's see. Yes, uh, actually in verse 20. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So it's not, it's not even that the church would receive the glory. It's certainly not that we as individuals would receive the glory. But through the church, God receives the glory. Through Christians, uh, he receives the glory. And so this is exactly what John is saying here in this John 3 at verse 27. Um, any comments or thoughts on opening his own will to God's. Anything you'd like to contribute? Dave? I've been studying a little about prayer. One of the things I've ran into is when, when we pray, 
It all should be with the intent. Yeah, we, we have people that are sick, people that had as, had accidents, things that weren't their fault, that they didn't have control over. And when we pray and ask for assistance and everything else, it, it should still all be for the glory of God. And, uh, sometimes it's a little hard for me to get my arms around, especially, I guess, through my selfish nature, uh, still being here. But, uh, yeah. Everything I've studied said our prayers need to be addressed with that thought in mind. Yeah. How is this going to glorify God? And I guess if then if we could word it properly, then maybe some things we get that in our mind, maybe some things we think that are just catastrophic, we get a better handle on it. And then we get to understand really, is this God will it be to glorify God and we focus a little bit better, at least myself. That's certainly true with the evidence of prayer. And I, I know Jane didn't like for me to mention her very often, I wonder, but she had an interesting study this morning uh, that she mentioned to me about the word sing or sang or sung. In the Old Testament, particularly, we know that there are nine passages in the New Testament that talk about singing. But she's gone back in her own private study and has been looking up passages in the Old Testament. And she's focusing on all of those that talk about glory unto God. In our psalms, not as David's pointed out, in our prayers, this is, should be the focal point. But our singing as well, and we don't hear that much uh, about praising God and glorifying God. Uh, we kind of leave that up to the people that are more emotional or whatever. But there are a lot of Old Testament passages that speak concerning our singing. What is the purpose? It's to glorify God. Ephesians Five talks about how we are to teach and admonish one another. That's part of it. But there are so many passages that just talk about glorifying God. And maybe in our singing, we need to emphasize that even more. I thought that was a good point. So I apologize to my wife for mentioning her, but it was just a good point that she made and I want to share with you. Anybody else have a thought? So both prayers and songs should be for the glory, the glory of God. And that's what John the Baptist was doing. He was also humble because he opened his eyes to Christ. Uh, we sometimes use a phrase, well, you're doing this blindly, or you're walking into this religion blindly. You don't know anything about it. Uh, you're just assuming that whatever the preacher has said or whatever some religious uh, person has said or a theologian has said, uh, told you that it means this or thus and so. But people sometimes just blindly follow. Um, you know, Jesus taught this, uh, the blind leading the blind, both are falling from the ditch. Well, that same principle is what we're looking at here with the fact that John wasn't blind, wasn't leading the blind, encouraging people to open their eyes and see uh, exactly who this Jesus is and what he should mean <clears throat> to them. He says uh, in John 3 and verse 30, he must increase. Now, John had a, a, a long, long for uh, Christ to be magnified, a longing for that. And he wanted to get all of the attention onto Christ and off of himself. And that goes back to kind of the factions we were talking about a while ago. But this is the heart's desire of the humble. You see, we, we humble ourselves, as Christians, we should humble ourselves to focus on, not just as was said with prayers and songs to give God the glory, but also that we might show that our heart's desire is for our humility as to be the opposite of proud people who want the recognition. The humble want all the glory and honor and recognition, recognition to go to the Lord. But the proud are just the opposite. They want to receive all the glory. And we see this in society all the time today. Um, it, it's all about me. And it's, you know, was, I was riding with the funeral director down to the cemetery today. I had that funeral at uh, 11 o'clock. And she and I were both talking about how no one or very few people have respect for anything anymore. And we talked about a number of things. And she talked about the couple of the guys at the funeral home had nearly gotten hit. Uh, she had nearly gotten hit here at the intersection of McDonald's uh, in a procession uh, because people were saying, get out of my way. And she said, one guy came through the middle of the procession, uh, honked his horn, rolled down his window, and started cursing at me. And I said, 
That's the thing I get all the time. I get that if I try to cross the highway at work. Now, 95% of the people are courteous. Some of them will even go so far as to slow down and stop. Not too many, but anyway, they at least let me get to the middle lane. And uh, I've taken the advice of Susie's granddaughter several months ago. She said, don't you be crossing that highway. It's too dangerous. So I took it to heart, and most of the time anymore, I drive over. It's just a short walk, but it's so dangerous. And the reason it's dangerous is because nobody has respect for anything. Not for age. <laughs> uh, we were talking about the funeral director and I was uh, talking about how long both of us had, had been married to our spouses. And I said, there's another problem. I said, hardly anybody gets married anymore. They, they have no respect for marriage. They have no respect for God if they even question whether there is a God or not. And on and on the list went. But we were talking about how dangerous it is just to live in society and to be out here on the roads, uh, not just an accident happening, but somebody intentionally causing uh, death. So, you know, we, we get upset because we read about uh, people's intent in the inner city, uh, inside 465, or how Chicago in the news is saying that people are leaving there in droves like they're leaving California. It's making it worse on wherever they're going because they're getting out of the city uh, where things are bad, but then that's not helping the people where they're going. And I realize that there are certain extenuating circumstances and all this. But what I'm saying is that when you have a humble person and not full of themselves, not full of pride, not arrogant, not get off of my highway, this is my road. How dare you drive on it? Um, when, rather than do that, the humble want all the glory to go to God. And so we're patient with people. At least we should be. And we're all human beings. As David said a while ago, because maybe it's human nature that uh, has some of the problems. We're all that way. We all have, we're, we're human beings. So we may have to work on some areas more than others. But if we can work on this humility, as John the Baptist work on his, we'll understand that in the process, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 at verse 18, listen to this one, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So here it's just like when, when you look at yourself in a mirror, I realize you see all of the, the facial features or whatever or how handsome you are, beautiful you are, or whatever it might be. But think the next time what Paul talks about here and what James talks about in looking at ourselves in a mirror. What do we see spiritually speaking? What is there for us to look at? And so this, this desire of those who uh, preach and teach, who minister humbly in the power of the Holy Spirit, stay close to the cross of Christ, uh, remembering uh, that he was crucified uh, and we in turn become more and more like Jesus. Uh, he increases. We see him more and more clearly. And that's again back to that passage in John 3 and verse 30. He must increase. When I look at myself in a mirror, that's what I need to see. I mean, I need to see Jesus increasing. In 1 John 3 verses 2 and 3, dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be, has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So here again is the this fourth reason that we have down here that John the Baptist opened the eyes of people that when they look in the mirror, they see the reflection of Jesus that they are the Christ, uh, not in the sense that he is the Messiah, but in the attributes and the characteristics that he had. That's what we need to see in ourselves. Anything down through the first four points there? You won't leave anybody out. Well, the next one I listed up there is John was hum humble because he closed his heart to self-seeking. And by that I mean, again, back to the John 3 and verse 30, but I must decrease. Uh, humility destroys uh, a person who is, is absorbed with themselves. The, the preoccupation, the self-sufficiency, the self-reliance. Uh, 
my desire becomes nothing compared to Christ, which becomes everything. And this humility is nowhere more beautifully expressed than when Paul confessed in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Again, I would remind you to look at that mirror. What do you see? What kind of reflection do you have of your soul, of your spirit? <coughs> Paul says, it's not I who even live. I'm in the flesh. But what I see is Christ living in me. Do you see that? I'm not asking you to testify or to raise your hand and say, yeah, pick on me, choose me. I, I'm that way. <laughs> mean to apply that at all. Uh, I'm simply saying that within yourself, you need to, as we mentioned several times in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether or not you're in the faith. Uh, along with that, Philippians 1, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Then the sixth thing I want to mention with John in his humility is because he opened his heart to spend much time in prayer. And David touched on this a little while ago when he talked about prayer. Back in Isaiah 40, and the glory going unto God, even in our prayers, especially in our prayers, and as I said, with our singing as well. When well, Luke 11 and verse 1, the scripture says, Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. You ever notice that phrase? As John, he set the precedent. Always think about Jesus setting the example, and he does. But here's a case where John, in his humility, was acknowledged by Jesus himself as teaching his disciples. Remember, John came along and was first baptizing near Anon in Salem. And he said that passage we read a while ago. And so he had those disciples that they were wanting to be in competition with Jesus' disciples. We talked about that, how that wasn't to be. But God saw true prayer promise in John the Baptist. Not only did he see a servant there, but he saw his prayerful attitude. And we usually think of John as, as a prophet and a martyr. Uh, and yet, our Lord's disciples remembered him as a man of prayer. Wouldn't, wouldn't that have been something to be talking with Jesus face to face and say, Oh, by the way, Jesus, John's been over here teaching people how to pray. Would you teach us how he was teaching them? That's what he's saying here. And so John's humility caused him to emphasize the importance of prayer. And the disciples of Jesus recognized the advantage that these disciples had in, in teaching uh, or being taught about prayer. Um, John, as we know, according to the plan of God, was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. And yet he had to pray. You know, I, I've talked to religious folks over the years. They said, well, I, if I could just be filled with the Holy Spirit, then I wouldn't have to be concerned about anything. Man, don't kid yourself. Here was John the Baptist who had the Holy Spirit, and he still had to pray. You think prayer isn't important or it has no power? John teaches us that it, that it does. He was privileged to introduce the Messiah to the nation of Israel, and yet he had to pray. Think about that. Here I am to introduce you to the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and seeing this, he, the, the greatest of prophets, and, and this Messiah, here he is, Israel. He's the one you've been waiting for. And so we, we see this prayerful attitude being ex exemplified. Let me add in Luke 7 and verse 28 that John had to be depend on prayer. If prayer was that vital to a man who had these many advantages, how much more important is prayer to us who don't have the advantages that John had? As I said, God providentially cared for John in that he handpicked him to do this role, play this role, carry out this mission as the forerunner of Christ. Now here we are and we say, well, if I could just be filled with the Spirit, if I just had more knowledge in God's Word, that in, in some sense that may apply. But you're still going to have to pray. 
you still need to take advantage of prayer. Prayer. John's disciples had to pray, and, and Jesus' disciples wanted to learn better how to pray. They didn't ask the master to teach them how to pray or do great signs. They asked him to teach them to pray. And I think if I would if I would been with Jesus as these disciples, I would say, by the way, Jesus, would you pray for me? And no doubt he would have. But they didn't even ask for that. They said, would you teach us to pray? That should be our thought as well. We understand where Jesus is reigning at the right hand of God, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we petition God through Christ in our prayers. But Christians, if, if we had been with the Lord, what would have been our response? Disciples were with him, yet they failed him many times. They could perform miracles, and yet they wanted to learn to pray. I just that kind of blows my mind. I mean, you you could be apostles of Jesus, you've got this power of the Holy Spirit set on you as like cloven tongues of fire back in Acts the first and second chapter, fulfilled the prophecy that had been uh, told for years and years, and now you've got this power of the Holy Spirit, you can go out and perform miracles, and people are just fascinated by this. And, and I and we know that there are a lot of uh, sensational seekers, you know, what's going to happen next? Let's just go for the sightseeing. But there are also many people who are genuine. And those are the people that John the Baptist was reaching. And so he says, they, they say, we can, we can perform these miracles, but you still need to pray. The apostles still needed to pray. Don't ever think that you become so righteous that you don't need to pray. I don't think there's anybody here like that. But I, I can see where it could happen. And when we go through uh, this, we, we see Luke shows more of Christ's prayers than any of the other uh, books or the, any of the other three uh, New Testament, uh, first New Testament books. For example, Luke records seven times Christ praying. Uh, he prayed at his baptism in Luke 3.21. He prayed before he chose the twelve in Luke 6.12. Uh, when the crowds increased in Luke 5, 16, before he asked the 12 for their confession of faith in Luke 9, 18, at his transfiguration, that is Christ's transfiguration in Luke 9, 29, at Gethsemane in Luke 22, 39 through 46, and on the cross in Luke 23, 34. Now, if Jesus, who was perfect, the very Son of God, needed so much prayer during the days of his flesh, which is a phrase I borrowed from you, Hebrews 5, 7, then how much more do we need to pray? Jesus prayed. Luke said it seven times, didn't he? And so you see that Jesus, being equal with God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Philippians chapter 2, took on the form of man and dwelt among us and came a little lower than the angels, took on this form of man and thereby he needed prayer, communication with his heavenly father. Sometimes people talk about the, the Lord's prayer, uh, Matthew 6, and that's not really the Lord's, Lord's prayer. I, I believe the Lord's prayer is in John 17 because that's when the Lord prayed to his heavenly father. You've given me these disciples, make us one, make us, let, let us fulfill your mission. That's really where he's praying. Well, form of time is completely gone. One more. Uh, John the Baptist was humble because he opened his mouth to praise. He didn't just feel it in his heart. Uh, it wasn't just a matter of fulfilling prophecy. But in Mark 1, 7 through 8, he preached saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So in this fashion, he humbled himself because he opened his mouth to praise and to praise the Lord. Okay, any, we've got about four minutes left. Anything that anybody wants to mention about John the Baptist? I went this whole direction, uh, first worked it up as a sermon and then decided to use it for class. So that's why it was, it was easy for me to preach because I knew where I was headed with it. But uh, again, anything you want to share with us? I'm looking back and up there to John Cole's part to the self-seeking. Uh, it shows there 
authority with that talk about it. But, uh, to me, that goes from uh, really verse 27 or 8 all the way down to the end of the chapter. Well, it sets up for us there, and he talks about pretty much that the whole book of the Yes. I mean, he's he taking that from him, you know, and talking about, hey, he's got to be the decree that Jesus has to have to be. That just kind of strikes me because that just, uh, that takes a special person to be willing to do that. But it takes a lot of all of that. Exactly right. Elizabeth? When you said that the people had to stand in the Bible and still the Holy Ghost, they didn't have to worry about anything. Well, in Acts 6, 3, they chose seven men that were full of the Holy Ghost with wisdom to serve faithfully. So they had still had work to do. Yeah, exactly. Good example. Any other thoughts? Well, as I sometimes say, either I thoroughly confuse you or I explain them so well you don't need to comment. So take your choice, whichever. <laughs> Next week, we come. I'm yeah, just going to say one more thing. You can see the whole thing of John. It's just a stepping stone up to Christ. I mean, it's, that's, that's perfect. Obviously, he understands that. Mm -hmm. And just really lays it out to a really good stepping stone to that. For whatever reason, most of the Jews never said that. Yeah. It just seems to me it just always struck me that it's so it could have been so simple for them, but they just never would accept it. Although it's not really the point of the lesson, but I mean I was just thinking that's a good comment anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next week we have the last two. Centurion and the Syrophoenician woman. And uh, I'm not sure whether we can cover them both at one time. They won't be as long as John the Baptist was, but I don't want to uh, do them injustice. I want to give them appropriate time. But anyway, uh, the Lord's willing, we'll at least talk about the Centurion and probably uh, the Syrophoenician woman and uh, possibly finish it up uh, and go on to something else then. That we'll be coming up on our gospel meeting, so may wait till uh, after the meeting to get into new material. Anything else anybody wants to mention this evening? Okay. We traditionally extend the gospel invitation to anyone who perhaps needs to initially be baptized into Christ, um, having heard the word of the, the gospel, repented of, believed in it, repented of their sins, confessed Jesus, and then want to be baptized uh, for the remission of their sins, or a person who has done that 
and has fallen back into the ways of the world and needs to come back and be restored. Uh, those of us who are Christians want to let our light shine, and we encourage you to join us in that. And I'm looking at a text this evening of Mark 4, 21 through 25. Uh, last week I was thinking of the children's song, Hide It Under a Bushel, No. Uh, and the story is taken from this passage in, in Mark 4. He was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be uh, put under a basket, is it, or under a bed, is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he was saying to them, take care of what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Now Jesus is referring to a basic lamp uh, that you would find in, in any Hebrew home. Uh, they, again, as we mentioned this evening in class, they didn't have the technology or whatever. And so they didn't go over and flip a switch or pull a chain or whatever to turn on a light. But it consisted of a small pitcher or saucer with a handle on one end. And then the pitcher would be filled with oil and a floating wick would be placed on that oil. And in order to maximize their light, the lamp was set on a lampstand or maybe a shelf uh, that was protruding from the wall. And there the, the light could spread throughout the room for obvious reasons. Uh, no one would place a lamp under a basket or under a bed uh, because it, was, it would hide the light and the lamp uh, could not fulfill its purpose. Uh, Jesus' point is quite clear. And those who have received the light of the gospel are not to conceal it. Uh, Solomon said in Proverbs 23 and verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not. So once we have that truth, we're not to conceal it or hide it, but we are to keep it for ourselves. In other passages, it is to be shared uh, with others. But rather, we are to let it, that light shine for others to see. And throughout the Bible, uh, the light is used as an object lesson for many things. Uh, sometimes it talks about truth. Uh, sometimes light is used for the word holiness. Uh, it's used for the spiritual life in Christ, the uh, gospel message itself, and Jesus himself. Again, the point is Jesus doesn't want you to hide what he has done in your life. Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, don't be timid, don't be shy. Uh, don't draw back from the fact that you are a Christian, but rather let your light shine. So the parable of the lamp tells us that we have an obligation, and since we have received the gospel, we are to live it openly, uh, share it with others, uh, how we might uh, help them to live in the way that they should. And those who have been transformed by the good news of the gospel uh, would present that to others. I'm looking at another passage here in Matthew 5, where Jesus explained, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. And then he goes ahead and explains uh, what we read a moment ago in Mark 4. So this is all about uh, your love for Christ, as we were discussing in the class this evening. Uh, be open about your love for others. Let Jesus uh, on the inside, let him be on the inside of you as people see your outside. Again, back to what we are talking this evening about the mirror and what image is reflected. Uh, your good deeds might well be an indication, a barometer, if you please, of what's going on in your life. It's the light that causes you as well as others to praise Him. So let your light shine. Be patient with those uh, that may be rude. We talked about that in class this evening as well. Uh, be kind when others would be harsh. And show love where others would be showing hatred. And be calm when others would be filled with panic. And basically, what we're seeing is let your good deeds shine out of all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father, the Bible says. So as a lamp, you want your light to shine. And the question is, does it? We're showing in this passage what we are to do. We are to let the light shine. But are we letting it shine? Do your neighbors know that you're a Christian? Do your friends and the rest of your family know that the light of God is within you and you want to share it with them? 
that you keep it burning, as I said from Proverbs 23 and 23, you have bought it and do not sell it. That doesn't mean that you can't share it with others. And so think about that if you're out of the ark of safety, if you're in the darkness of the world, that you would want to make this hour of your decision to come into the light of God. And if you've never done that, you do it, as I said earlier, through faith, repentance, and baptism. Or if you've gone back into the darkness, come back into the avenue of prayer, you can be restored. If you need assistance, please come as together we stand and sing.
Okay, Carter. Thank you. 